And uh, finally today, uh, Nick James, Comet Section Director. And uh, you know all about him because he received a big award last, uh, and I, I praised him to the hilt last meeting. That's very good of you, David. Thank you. Um, <laughs> he's uh, going to tell us everything that he knows about uh, what's coming up in the sky shortly. And probably several things I don't know either. So, um, Simon, ah, brilliant. Okay. So, it's, it's not often that I praise clouds in these SkyNote <laughs> sessions. But um, these are, and, and except in the summer when we talk about noctilucent clouds, which are clouds very, very high up in the mesosphere, um, these are clouds, and they, they're only generally visible in the summer, these are clouds that you can see in the winter. <coughs> rare. So, yeah, if we could have the lights down as far as it's safe to go, basically. Um, <clears throat> these are what are called nacreous clouds, or mother-of-pearl clouds, and there was a really nice display of them um, in uh, just before Christmas, 21st of December. Uh, unfortunately, that day it was cloudy where I was, but uh, this is a picture by Adam Rawlinson of these nacreous clouds. It doesn't come out too well on the screen here, but they're, they're called mother of pearl clouds. They basically you can see sort of purple and green and lots of different colours in them. So, um, so that's another kind of cloud that we as astronomers can, can potentially uh, embrace uh, but not the kind of clouds that we had over the last two weeks of December and the first week of January, when certainly where I was, I don't think I saw the sun for about three weeks, which is awful. Um, but the sun has been increasing in activity. This is a, a picture um, in white light from a few days ago, the 15th of January, um, showing quite a few nice spot groups. And at the moment on the BAA website, if you go... This is actually our picture of the week, a really nice picture uh, by Anton Matthews showing the sun in hydrogen alpha taken on January the 16th. So lots of detail there. And of course, these days you can buy, for not huge amounts of money, although they are still quite expensive, you can buy uh, telescopes that allow you to see prominences and other features on the sun which you can't see in white light. So in terms of, you know, comparing buying a telescope that can do this to the cost of maybe going and seeing a total eclipse when you get 30 seconds or maybe, if you're lucky, four minutes of being able to see the prominences, you can, you can see, see them all the time when it's clear. But this is taken with a telescope with a particular filter that filters out the light that you're interested in. Another interesting way of looking at the sun in monochromatic light uh, is this example here by Alan Halsey. So he's using a thing called a Solex SHG. So I've spoken quite a lot in these talks about amateur spectroscopy. And this is essentially a spectroscope. It's a spec what's called a spectroheliosope. <coughs> so it contains a diffraction grating that splits light up into lots of different wavelengths. But essentially the slit um, can be scanned across the object that you're looking at to form an image. So... In days gone by, spectroheliosopes were huge things. Uh, Henry Hatfield was mentioned earlier on today, and he built a house, basically, to house his spectroheliosope. <laughs> <laughs> These days, you can make spectroheliosopes that are much smaller. And uh, this Solex, actually, a lot of the components for this are 3D printed. So if you're interested in actually making one of these, you can go online and you can basically download <coughs> all the plans that allow you to make uh, your own spectroheliosope. Uh, but yeah, this is a really good example. This is looking in the light of calcium K, but because it's a spectroheliosope, you can tune the, the thing to whichever particular wavelength you're interested in. So rather than just buying a telescope with a filter that, that allows you to look at H alpha or calcium or whatever, this thing allows you to choose any wavelength you like, like and image the sun in monochromatic light, which I think is a really, really neat thing. And the fact that these spectroscopes are, spectroheliosopes are actually designed by very clever people who then made their designs public, uh, and you can go out and make it, I think is a really good example of, uh, of how kind of amateur astronomy advances with people doing clever things, then other people coming along and following up on it. Um, so I usually have a few nice pictures of aurorae, but there haven't been a huge number. Um, this one, though, from Callum Potter up in Roisley, up in um, Orkney. Uh, was taken just before Christmas, December the 18th. It's a panorama um, taken with a Sony A7 and a 21mm lens. 
And as Callum says, the, the software that you can get these days, which is usually really good at joining pictures together into panoramas, isn't quite so good at joining auroras and star fields because there's not a huge amount of detail there for the software to see. But um, I think that's a nice, nice example. Um, there's various people. So this is from, um, I was going to say it's from Great Britain. It's from just off the north coast of Great Britain. But a number of people have been away on their winter holes on, on ships up the coast of Norway and other places and have seen good aurorae as well. Um, just coming back to the nacreous clouds, um, Nick Hewitt here submitted an image of that too from Northampton. Um, I think that probably shows the, the colours a little bit better. And then this one again is Adam Rawlinson's picture showing, uh, showing those nacreous clouds above all of the tropospheric cumulus clouds. He was in Kent, he got quite good view, uh, looking west, all of that rubbish on the horizon there is what I was under up in Essex. <laughs> um, so let's uh, just start as well, kind of with astronomical objects, um, other than the sun, so the moon. Uh, this is a, a picture of the moon taken in a way that uh, a lot of people do these days, and Mary was talking about outreach, and I've done quite a lot of outreach at, at schools where you, you go in, kind of in the evening when the moon's in the sky, take a telescope. The, the kids are really kind of amazed by looking at the moon, but the one thing they really want to do is they want to put their phone at the eyepiece and they want to take a picture. And uh, the moon is obviously the thing to do that with. And this is what Mark Fairfax has done. He's basically stuck this at the eyepiece of his Dobsonian, um, an iPhone at the eyepiece, and we've got a really nice picture of the moon there. And it is quite amazing, modern phones, um, it can be quite fiddly, but, but six-year-old kids seem to manage it very easily, much more easily than I can. But they can, uh, they can get really good images, and they're sort of keepsakes to take home with them. Um, so in terms of what the moon's doing, we're just coming up to full moon, uh, which will be on January the 25th, so this coming week. Um, the phases in green there are when there are various eclipses happening. So the April the 8th one is the one that we all know about. That's the total eclipse that's going to be over the US. Um, not long away now. March 25th, full moon. It's a penumbral eclipse of the moon that is visible from here. There is um, a partial eclipse of the moon then on September the 18th that's visible from here too. So we've got two lunar eclipses that we can observe from this country this year. And then on October the 2nd is an annular eclipse which is visible over the South Pacific and South America. So in two of those cases, the moon is doing its good job as an occulting disk to block out the photosphere of the sun. Um, and in the other two, the Earth is doing a good job of basically casting a shadow on the moon. The moon is a little bit more, of course, than an occulting disk. Even I would admit that. And um, very impressive images that people can get these days. This is, it's always been an interesting crater pair that has interested me. It's, um, they used to be called Messier and Pickering, but for some reason the names got changed to Messier and Messier A. But they're a very interesting pair of craters, asymmetric craters. And this picture by Dave Finnegan shows them very, very well. Um, and even I, who curse the bright moon in the sky, often um, do, do look at it. And it's a fascinating object to look at, the amount of detail that we can see and the amount of detail that people image now. Jumping a little bit to much smaller things, so the dust that comes off comets and asteroids entering our atmosphere. Um, I first showed one of these plots at the Christmas meeting, and various people asked me to, uh, to, to show some updated ones. So I'll try and do this every time I do Skynet. So this basically is showing from the GMN cameras that Mary mentioned uh, that people are setting up all over the place, and they are really good outreach. These are video cameras that are looking at the sky continually with soft, really clever software um, that basically make a completely automated system. So you can set these cameras up and almost forget about them. And they feed data on all the meteors that they observe into a central computer, which can calculate then, if you get meteors observed from two different locations, can calculate the meteor radiance. And what this is is a plot of those radiants in RA and DEC. So uh, basically, that's going north, deck up, uh, and RA is east-west. And what you see color-coded there is the geocentric entrance velocity of the radiance. 
and you can see that there are little clumps of stuff which are meteor showers. Now that big clump that you saw there, that red clump, which will come around again, that one there, is the Geminids, which is the, the most active meteor shower that we see in the year. It was a really good Geminid display um, last year, 2023, on December the 14th. There was no moon in the sky to cause problems, but it was cloudy over a lot of the country. And so unfortunately, a, a lot of people didn't get to experience that. But it was a very, very um, active display. And I was lucky enough to have about two hours of clear sky on the morning of December the 14th. And my meteor cameras got hundreds and hundreds of events in those two hours. But, but GMN is good because it's a global network. And so it's not affected by kind of local weather. There's another clump on there, which is, uh, you'll see uh, that red clump over on the right-hand side, at a high declination. <clears throat> That's the quadrantids. And the quadrantids are, again, another, another active shower. But they're often not seen very much <coughs> because they take place early in January, January the, the 3rd, 4th. Uh, when the weather again isn't too good. But we were lucky over the UK to actually have some reasonably good clear skies for the quadrantids. Um, so I've got a couple of really nice pictures. This one I thought particularly good. So um, Grant uh, Privet often uses Stonehenge as a sort of foreground for his astro pictures, and I think it really works very well. Yeah. So here you've got Stonehenge, Orion, Sirius, and a Geminid up in the sky there. So Really nice picture. When, when they built Stonehenge, they, they obviously didn't quite think that it would in future be used as a foreground for astrophotography, but I think it works. It works really, really well. Um, the camera of choice, if you want to actually video um, meteors, is the camera that everyone uses for low light video, and that's the Sony A7S. So if you ever see any kind of real time video of Rory, uh, that will generally be an A7S. So this Steve Knight video, really nice, <laughs> angry, shows what a meteor looks like in, in real time on a video. And often, if you just see a sort of still frame, you don't see this, because essentially what you're seeing is, is all of this light just gets stretched out into a line. But here you can see the train behind the meteor that's visible for a short period of time. Um, as the meteor heats up the atmosphere, ionizes um, molecules high up in the atmosphere, which then come back together slowly to recombine, and that forms that train. So uh, that's a really nice one. And then just another example, this is a quadrantid. This is from one of my GMN cameras in Chelmsford. Um, this is a, a still that's made by the GMN software by stacking individual video frames, but you can also access the video too. Uh, but this is a nice example of that, and it's also a good example of of how these cameras work. See, these GMN cameras are quite infrared sensitive. So if you look on here, this is the familiar constellation of Auriga. You've got Capella there with the kids here. But what's this up here? You've got two bright stars in Capella, and that, that one there is, is not normally something that you would see with the naked eye. It's actually a long period variable, a very red star, which is very bright in the infrared. So it shows up in these uh, stacked meteor images. So the quadrantids, uh, nice shower, an active shower, but very short. You've got, to be, you've got to be in the right place in the right time to see the quadrantids. But we had a good run this year with them. So where are we at the moment? We're, we're past the solstice. Nights are beginning to get shorter. Sun's setting a little bit later each day, although not by very much. But in the evening sky, in the west, we've got all of those familiar constellations of summer. Um, gradually disappearing. So Cygnus here, and for me at the moment, Cygnus is a really interesting and important constellation because it contains the most interesting comet that we've got in the sky at the moment, which I'll talk about a little bit later, Comet 12P uh, Pons Brooks. Um, but this, this is gradually dis disappearing, as is the comet in the evening sky, but it's far enough north for us that we can actually pick it up in the morning sky too. Uh, another thing that's disappearing is the planet Saturn, which is just right over here in Aquarius. Um, that's at a fairly sudden declination anyway, but it's gradually disappearing into the western sky. So it's becoming more and more difficult to image Saturn. Uh, but got a nice composite image. I think it's actually not a composite. This is just processed, uh, same video, but processed in different ways, which shows Saturn 
and its moons. So again, the rings of Saturn are closing up. So the next uh, next year, when we uh, or when Saturn comes out of conjunction again, the rings will have closed even further. And I think the ring plane crossings are in 2025 for Saturn. Um, so Saturn looks very different when the rings are, are really closed, but it's still an amazing object to see in a telescope. And if you if you are doing outreach after the moon, it's probably the thing that makes everyone just kind of go, wow, uh, an amazing, amazing thing for people to actually see live through an eyepiece. Of course, the brightest thing in the evening sky at the moment, really dominating the evening sky, well, apart from the moon, of course, is, is the planet Jupiter. Um, Jupiter's been around for quite a long time now. It's at a reasonable detonation. It gets, it gets nice and high up. Um, you might have noticed uh, a couple of nights ago, the moon passed it, and uh, this is uh, an image that David sent me of the moon at the top there, and that little faint thing right at the bottom is Jupiter <coughs> there. Um, but with the naked eye, that was a really striking pairing yeah. a few nights ago, and quite a lot of people commented on that to me the next day in work, asking what it was. <laughs> Which for a load of space engineers, I was really disappointed about that they didn't actually know that it was Jupiter, but there you go. <laughs> so, uh, I like this, because it demonstrates something that's really interesting about Jupiter's satellites. So Jupiter's got four bright satellites, the Galileans, but three of them are in what's called an orbital resonance. So essentially, Io, um, Europa, and Ganymede have, over, over time, ended up in locked orbits with a ratio of 1, 2, and 4. So this was sent to me by John Rogers. This is a, um, a thing that's been happening basically on Saturday nights, and the, the last good one is tonight or early Sunday morning, where you have Io, Ganymede, and Europa in this configuration, basically Io... Uh, about to go into um, eclipse, and then Ganymede and Europa transiting Jupiter. And because the, um, the orbit of uh, Ganymede is just over seven days, this thing happens every, has happened every Saturday for a while, uh, and as I say, we're just falling out of it now. But if you, if you go home and if the sky is clear tonight, have a look at Jupiter, because you'll have the opportunity to see one of the last good ones like this in this series. So with uh, two of the satellites... In front of Jupiter, in transit, one of them just going behind. Um, so, again, Peter Tickner has been taking a lot of uh, images of Jupiter. Um, so, really good quality images, although they, they don't look quite so good on the screen here. They're much better if you actually go online, have a look on the members' site on the BAA. You get much better quality. But just an example of, uh, of images of Jupiter taken over a, a period um, which show the rotation. Jupiter rotates in just over 10 hours, and so the rotation is very apparent over short periods. And again, if, you, if you're doing outreach, showing kids Jupiter and showing them the Galilean moons and how they move around Jupiter, it's something that in a few minutes you can actually see changes in the, um, in the arrangement of the different moons. One thing, though, that has happened with Jupiter is that the great red spot has shrunk and shrunk and is now really the not the great red spot anymore, it's the kind of not quite so great or, or sort of medium-sized red spot. But at the Christmas meeting, I showed an example of um, images of Jupiter taken one rotation apart, animated. And this is another example of that. And it's really interesting to see because you can see the flow of material around the great red spot. Um, and you can see the, the sort of relative movement of material in the, in the belts and zones of Jupiter. And it's something that uh, John Rogers um, sends me more and more of these things now, in that because there are more observers around who can do very high resolution of Jupiter, it's quite often that you get two uh, images, high resolution images, taken at the same um, central meridian longitude, but uh, one rotation apart. And they do show, they, they show really interesting features. And I remember from... Years and years ago, when the Voyagers passed Jupiter, the sort of first images that showed rotation of material around the Great Red Spot, and the, the fact that amateurs can do this uh, now without sending a spacecraft all the way to Jupiter is really impressive stuff, I think. Um, so, so this is a Martin Lewis image of Jupiter, again, with that reduced size Great Red Spot. 
And it illustrates something that Paul's going to get very angry with me in a minute, is the, the fact that if you're trying to compare images of planets, there's no real agreement as to whether they should be north up or south up. So this one happens to be south up. The previous ones were north up. And to give you an example of why that matters, this is a, a nice little video by Mike Fuchs of um, Io and Europa uh, going into um, occultation behind Jupiter. Now, this is a north-ish up. In fact, north is kind of that way-ish. And then Paul happened to send me a drawing that was making it made at exactly the same time, which in order that you can compare it with the image, I've had to turn upside down. I know that. True. Now, if I, if, I, if I had made a little bit more effort, I could have cut Jupiter out of the middle of that and turned it upside down without turning the text up and down. But it was just to, just to illustrate that it would be nice if planetary observers could actually agree to use north up like everyone else does. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so this is uh, an example of a drawing of, of Jupiter. And I think it's great that Paul continues the tradition of drawing as to a few people. <laughs> we could do. In fact, we could spend an hour on council discussing it, David. <laughs> um, this is really good. So this is north up as well. This is essentially taking images of Jupiter and unraveling them into a kind of Mercator map of Jupiter. So you've got the, the great red or the little red spot here. And it really kind of demonstrates in this projection that the red spot actually is really quite small now. It doesn't extend over many, long, uh, many degrees of longitude of Jupiter. So whether that's going to be a thing that continues and maybe will be the last generation or two to actually have a red spot or whether it will revive, I don't know. But um, it, it's certainly continuing to shrink. as to why it's shrinking. Well, I mean, it's, it's a weather feature, isn't it? So weather features are not permanent anyway. I mean, the, the, the amazing thing is that it's been there for so long, I suppose. I mean, that you can have a cyclonic feature like that in the atmosphere of a planet that is so stable that it's been there for hundreds of years. But there's no particular reason why it should last forever. Because there's no, there's no surface of Jupiter for it that's causing it. But we will find out, I suppose. You know, come back in a hundred years, and we'll, we'll see. Is there a surface? That's the problem. There's no land for it to fall on. Okay. Is it okay. Is it okay. Yeah, but so, so there's lots of other things in the, uh, well, it, on those latitudes. Um, so the one in the north. Yeah. 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 Well, that's the country closest in my department. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Nobody, nobody knows. But I mean, it's been very long lived. It's been there. It's been there for at least. Uh, it's probably not two. the same spot that Hawkes built. Do you think? Do you think? No. Right. Uh, so it's certainly, certainly been there for. Hundred and fifty, two hundred years. Yeah, years. yeah. 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 Um, which almost felt like it did it over Essex at Christmas with the weather system that we had then, which was <laughs> blocked. Um, so this is really nice. This isn't an amateur image, but this is an image of Io by uh, Juno. Um, so John sent me this. So one of the nice things about Juno is it's got a camera, but the data from that camera gets processed by amateur image processors. And this is a wonderful processing of it by Gerald Eichstadt. This is actually a picture from above the North Pole of Io. And um, it's difficult to see on the screen, but... Uh, this part, which is the night side, is being illuminated by Jupiter. So if you imagine that you're sitting on Io, Jupiter is a huge disk in the sky, very bright. And so this is essentially Jupiter shine over this side. And you can actually see some features beyond the Terminator here. But the most interesting one is Lockie, which is this uh, volcanic feature here, um, which actually doesn't seem to have changed very much, John says, in 20-odd years. Uh, but a very interesting moon, and you certainly wouldn't want to live on Io. It's a very unpleasant place, bathed in Jupiter's radiation fields, um, all sorts of volcanic activity going on. So back to the sky. Um, this is the sky about midnight. 
So you've got, when in the winter, you've got Capella high up. Um, you've got Ursa Major uh, near the zenith, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and you have the sort of stars of the springtime coming up in the east, so Boötes and Virgo. And of course, Virgo is where all the galaxies are. So we're in that transitional time of the year at the moment where we're going from the kind of really bright stars of the winter constellations, Orion, Monoceros, Gemini, Taurus, and we're exchanging them for the rather less showy stars of the, the spring sky, so Leo, Cancer, Virgo. Uh, but that's, that's where all the galaxies are. This is where all the showy kind of deep sky stuff is. Early in the morning, though, if you get up, um, it doesn't need to be that late. I mean, if you get up 7, 7.30 and go out, you'll see a very, very bright object, very low down in the southeast, and that's Venus. And what's remarkable, although it happens every time Venus goes around the sun, is just how quickly Venus has gone uh, from being quite high up in the morning sky to being very low down. And that's because of the geometry. It's essentially moving away from us, moving across, uh, moving towards superior conjunction, but it doesn't get there for a long time. But it's also moved a long way south in the sky. And so Venus is very low down, uh, but it's still a very, very prominent object. And it has been for the last few mornings when it's been very transparent, very clear in the morning. Uh, that very bright star-like thing in the southeast is Venus. And here are some drawings. I'm sure you I'm sure you could probably size me. So here are some drawings by Paul of Venus. And the reason I put them this way up is that all of the images I've got are north up. So just one. I could do that. I could do that. Um, so again, some, some features on Venus. This one I rather like, though. This is um, just shows how incredibly bright Venus is. This is uh, Mazin Yunus's picture that he posted on the BAA webpage. Um, from just at the end of last year, December the 31st, showing Venus rising above a local ridge where his uh, telescope is in Morocco. So he has a remote telescope in Morocco, um, which if you read, there was an article in the journal a few journals ago about how he set that up and, and uh, the people who've helped him with it. So a really interesting story, but producing some really nice results as well. But because Venus is so low down now, pretty much lost it from an imaging point of view from the northern hemisphere. Um, so this is, these are Clyde Foster images, and we had Clyde on uh, at our meeting, uh, again, a few meetings ago, from Namibia, where Venus is high up in the sky, imaging it. It's now a gibbous phase, getting quite small as it moves away from the Earth. But uh, detail here visible both in the, um, the left-hand images, which are infrared, I think, and the right-hand images, which are UV. Just before Christmas, I mentioned this. This was an occultation of Betelgeuse by an asteroid, um, asteroid Leona. And I suggested that various people might uh, try and observe with this with remote telescopes. Um, Alex Pratt uh, actually went down, did the much better thing, and went down to a golf resort in Spain with some equipment to actually observe it and uh, got this rather nice light curve. But what's more impressive, I think, is this. And I'm not sure how well this will come out on the screen. This is a video he shot. Yeah, this is a video he shot of Orion. So there's the belt stars, there's Rigel, there's uh, Betelgeuse. And if you watch it, um, Betelgeuse will disappear for a while. So that must have been a pretty cool thing to see with the naked eye, um, to see a, a star disappear um, because an asteroid went in front of it. And what's interesting, and the reason for the shape of this light curve being a kind of a U-shape like this, is this was a, essentially an annular eclipse of Betelgeuse. The apparent diameter of the asteroid was about the same or a little bit smaller than the apparent diameter of Betelgeuse. So essentially at the middle of this eclipse, you could still see Betelgeuse shining around the outside of the asteroid, which is uh, pretty amazing. Right, on to comets. 
So there's three interesting comments around at the moment. Well, there's a lot more than that, but probably three, three interesting comments um, that I want to talk about. This one is Comet 62P, Shushin Shan. Um, it's uh, bright, the brightest comet around at the moment. It's, it's best seen in the morning sky. And this Mazin Yunis picture from Morocco shows that it actually has quite a nice ion tail. So, whoops, here we go. This is the ion tail there in a, in a pushed image. Um, but it's a kind of typical big extended coma comet. Um, the magnitude is a bit misleading in that, like with all comets, because the, the light is spread out over a large area, it's a very, very difficult thing to see visually. Um, but it's, it's a nice imaging target. Uh, oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I, uh, the trouble is, I'm no, I don't actually know where these things are. I just tell the telescope to go and point them. But it, it, it is a, it's, a, it's best seen in the morning sky. Is it Virgo? Oh, it is Virgo, because in fact, and in fact, I'll show you a picture in a minute taken by... Uh, somebody's showing it in front of um, some Virgo cluster of galaxies. So there you go. So deep sky person knows more about where a comet is than the comet section director is. Um, the other comets that are interesting are interesting because they outburst regularly. So this one is a comet 12, uh, 29P Schwachmann Backman which we've been observing for a long time. It's in a almost circular orbit um, outside the orbit of Jupiter. And it uh, outbursts quite regularly. And Richard Miles runs a project for the BAA called Mission 29P, which compiles all the observations together. And he's formulating a theory as to why these outbursts happen. There, there, are, there are theories in the professional comet world, but they really don't explain how these outbursts can happen in such a regular way and be uh, essentially predictable in the way that they are and can lead to the effects that we see. And so we've got 29P, which we've been studying for quite a few years, uh, which has actually just recently gone into outburst just a few days ago. So this is a, a picture um, taken by Dave Storey in the Isle of Man from the Glyn Marsh Observatory in the Isle of Man. And Dennis Brzezinski, detected it going into outburst. So this is a light curve that uh, um, Richard maintains. And you can see here, um, it's just gone into outburst. So it's, it's kind of jumped up by a couple of magnitudes. Um, it goes into outburst and then it fades away again. And until recently, 12P was, was fairly unique in the way that it behaved. But we have a comet coming back now, which is 12P Pons Brooks, which we know from past returns, because this is a comet with a period of just over 70 years, we know when it last came back, it had outbursts. And we've been lucky enough to be able to see these outbursts ourselves this time back. So this is the, the big outburst that occurred back in November, on November the 14th. So what you have here is you have the comet nucleus. Effectively, all of a sudden, ejects a large amount of material. So gas, and the gas takes out with it dust. And what we're seeing here is the expansion of two spherical coma. The central bright one is the dust, and the fainter one is gas. And in images, you can see the fainter one is a kind of greenish color. The central one is white. So what we're seeing here is, is dust that's been ejected from the comet by the, the, the gas um, in, a, in a very, very sudden event. So, this isn't over a period of hours, this is over a period of minutes because we've detected these outbursts occurring and we can see how rapidly the, the comet brightness changes. The, the ejection velocity for this comet, 12p, um, is of the order of three or 400 meters per second for the, for the dust material. So this was back in November. The comet has been fairly quiet for a while actually but it's been going through Cygnus, and so it's past some really nice deep sky objects. So this is another Mazin Yunus image of the comet sailing past the Crescent Nebula in Cygnus. And Paul, again, our indefatigable visual observer, has been observing it. It's really interesting, actually, because to those of us who are imaging this comet, it's quite a bright object. 
it's a really ob easy object to image. But as a visual observer, it's much more difficult because essentially the light is spread out over a large, large area. So Paul's been doing a really good job, and he actually um, sent me a message uh, when he made this observation saying that he wasn't entirely sure uh, that it was the comet, but it definitely is. It's in the right place. But it so happens that this was one day before the comet went into outburst again. And unfortunately, on the day it went into outburst, Paul, you didn't get home early enough to be able to observe it. It was treed out. It was treed out, because it is quite low down now in Cygnus in the evening sky. So this is the light curve that we're maintaining for this comet so far, and it's, it's a fascinating light curve. So what you can see here, we're looking at not the total magnitude of the comet, which doesn't vary by a huge amount, but we're looking at the magnitude of the very central part of the comet in, in a very small photometric aperture. And what we can see here is these um, sudden changes, and in fact on these plots, so this is where we caught it actually in the, in the process of outbursting. You can see there, there are three outbursts that took place, the November one, one in uh, late November, and then one in um, mid-December. And they're all about 15 days apart. So you can see there's a kind of period there. Um, but it turns out that we didn't have an outburst at the predicted 15 days after, after that third one. It's about 35 days. But this is the outburst that we've just had. Um, just a, a day or two ago, again, Denis Brzezinski uh, detected that with John Francois Soulier in France, who detected it at the same time. About as soon as it got dark um, on, on the night of the 18th. Um, so we've got some images of that. This is uh, Dennis's image showing it very early in the outburst with the kind of bright core and then expanding. And then I've got a slide that I've got in completely the wrong order. <laughs> so you'll just have to forgive me, but I, I don't know why this got in the wrong place. This is 62P again, but uh, by Peter Tickner. So this is the comet that's got the, the nice ion tail, and it's the one that's crossing Virgo. So you've got some nice Virgo galaxies. So a brief interlude going on that comet, and then back uh, to uh, 12p. So this is 12p expansion over, over one night. So uh, the image on the left there was taken um, on the 18th, just about, we think, about 10 hours after the outburst. The image on the right was taken on the 19th, about 34 hours after the outburst. And you can see the sort of familiar structure here in that... Um, you get brighter rays and you get a darker rift. Um, and Richard explains that by the geometry of the way that the outburst happens and how the outflow from the outburst is blocked by the nucleus itself right at the time of the outburst. And then that explains uh, a lot of what we actually see in the expanding coma. In terms of the total magnitude of the comet, it's all over the place. Uh, variable star observers would hate this. This is basically um, tracking the, um, the peak brightness. So you've got all these outbursts. Um, but it's predicting a brightness of somewhere around 4 at perihelion, possibly a little bit brighter than that. And the, and the reason that's quite interesting to me is that the total eclipse of April the 8th potentially gives us an opportunity to observe that comet because it will be in the sky about 20 degrees from the sun, not far from Jupiter in the sky during that total eclipse. Now, depending on how bright the comet is, and it's probably not going to be much brighter than four, maybe three, and it's quite an extended object, it might be potentially visible in binoculars during the eclipse, and you've got four minutes to have a look for it. But it certainly should be something you can pick up on photographs. So maybe as an opportunity to take a picture of a comet in an eclipse if, you're, if you happen to be out there. Right at the other end of the scale, just to show you that we look at comets of all magnitudes, this is a comet that's currently not yet confirmed a comet. It's on a thing called the Possible Comets Confirmation page. Uh, but Peter Bertwistle and I imaged this the other night. And I think you can see there's a kind of little tail here. So these comets are put on that page when they don't know whether they're actually comets or not. And I think this probably confirms that it does. But this is a, a comet that's magnitude 18 and a half. Um, so not the kind of thing that many people will bother with. So, leaving comets behind, 
and going for variables now. This variable, this uh, supernova in M101, has been there for an awfully long time. It's still there. M101 is now a, a morning object for us. Uh, but the BAA light curve is really phenomenal for that. It's really well sampled light curve. And you can see a really interesting profile. So it's, it's an object that's still there, still, still worth following um, in a nice galaxy. Uh, but it does involve you getting up in the morning. We've had another nice supernova recently in, a, in another nice galaxy. So this one in NGC 4216, um, which I think is in Virgo again, isn't it, Nick? Um, that's where most galaxies are. So this is SN 2024 GY. So this picture by Norman Gray shows it nicely. And then we've got another picture here by David Strange in color showing it too. Uh, we have an old nova, which has been around again for a long time, but is still reasonably bright. This is the Nova in Cassiopeia, Nova Cass 2021, B1405 Cass. Uh, and this picture here by Mazin Yunus shows that it's in a really nice part of the sky. So you've got the bubble nebula here. And that Nova is still around and is still actually reasonably bright. So it's, it's still about 12th magnitude or so. So it's a, a Nova that looks like it's going to be with us for a, a very long time. If you're into um, looking for outbursts of variable stars, though, you do need to get up in the morning because the most interesting one, and this is the one that Jeremy has mentioned several times and I've mentioned several times, is in uh, Corona Borealis here. It's uh, T Corona Borealis. So this is the star which we think is going to go into an outburst sometime this year, sometime, do we have a better prediction, sometime kind of April time, is that? Right, so there you go. So, but it's a, it's a star that's definitely worth observing. So, luckily, this, this is an image uh, from Mike Harlow that was put up on the website uh, from this morning, um, I think. Are we the 20th of January today? Yep. yep. So, from this morning. So, that's, that's uh, kind of right bang up to date, showing T Corona Borealis there, and the light curve here showing these various um, oscillations um, that are, are there, but then there's also a general fading, which is a precursor to, uh, to this outburst happening. So definitely worth keeping an eye on that. Then in terms of other things on the um, observers uh, forum on the website, I did chuckle over this one. Anyone, anyone who struggled, anyone who struggled with accessing a website by, you know, click on all the squares that have a bus in them or something. Um, so this, this I thought from Steve was really good. This is uh, click on all the squares that have got quasar in them. <laughs> is that right? Is that right, Matthew? There's always three. Second row, third to the left. Right, OK. But you know, because you put it together. But I, I find these things really irritating. But anyway, this, this, uh, this is quite good and made me chuckle. And it actually encouraged um, Robin Ledbetter to go out and actually do some spectroscopy of these things. And again, amazing that amateur spectroscopy is so good now. You know, you can pick up redshifts of objects. So these, these are really interesting spectra where spectral lines, which would normally be far in the UV and not detectable by amateurs on the Earth's surface, have been redshifted far enough that we can detect them. So just one final thing before I finish, coming up to the end of this, you'll be pleased to hear, is this. So... The moon, I mentioned earlier, is being a good occulting disk in a, an interesting place. But it's a, it's a place where lots of people have been sending spacecraft recently. But it seems to be eating or killing most of the spacecraft that go there. So there was a Japanese lander that landed, I think, yesterday, which has suffered a power failure. But this is Peregrine, which is one of the first, what well, is the first commercial lander that America has sent to the moon. Um, it was launched on the new Vulcan Centaur rocket. Go so this is the rocket Go that replaces the, the Go good old Atlas Centaur with um, a Vulcan stage, which is actually, the, the propellants in this are the same as, uh, as what Elon Musk Nine, uses in the eight, um, seven, Starship six, uh, launch. It's five, methane, four, liquid methane and liquid three. oxygen. So you can see the flame is quite blue, because basically it's burning natural gas. Um, so this rocket launched um, Peregrine, launch top stage is the uh, launching a new Centaur, era in space flight to the and it's the Centaur and that pushes Peregrine off towards its long looping orbit of the moon. But we were very lucky 
in that it was launched in such a way that we had a really good view of it from here um, in the night sky throughout the night as it moved gradually towards the moon. So here it is. This is the lander um, taken on the 9th of January by Grant Privet. And then Nick Quinn took another image of it here. So in, in, in Grant's image, the stars are fixed, but you can see the lander moving with respect to the stars. In Nick's one, the stars have been trailed so that you can see the lander because it's much fainter here. So this is when the lander was at Apogee, which was basically the distance of the moon. Um, I've got an image of it there as well, so here it is. Um, and, and the reason we could do that is that the, the orbit basically was fired into an orbit, a very long elliptical orbit that went up to the altitude of the moon, but the moon wasn't there on the first time it went by. So the idea was that it would actually be captured by the moon on the second time around. But unfortunately, the lander had a propellant leak, which meant that it couldn't actually land on the moon. So what they decided to do was just let it go all the way around, come back again, and re-enter the Earth's atmosphere after uh, a 10-day or so trip to the moon and back, um, which it did a couple of days ago over the Pacific. And this is my last view of it, was in the morning of the day that it actually re-entered. So this is the morning of the 18th, I think. What was interesting, and I didn't realize at the time when I took this picture of the uh, lander, was that at exactly the time I put, took the picture of this lander, the lander was taking a picture of me. So this was taken at the time I was imaging the lander. In the morning, coming up to morning twilight, so you know, we're, we're near that morning terminator. So that's kind of two, two ways. It was taking a picture of me, and I was taking a picture of it. So that's, that's quite good. The Centaur stage um, just got pushed out into heliocentric orbit. And part of the problem with that is that nobody tracks it. Once it's been pushed out into heliocentric orbit, it's been disposed of, nobody tracks it. But amateurs can do astrometry of this. So we can predict what's going to happen to the Centaur stage. And in fact, it's going to come back to the Earth in 2037. So whatever asteroid surveys there are out there will discover some mysterious thing in a heliocentric orbit in 2037, uh, which if hopefully, if they've got access to the data we created, they'll know is actually the centaur from this launch and not some little green men who are coming in to invade the Earth. So it's been a really interesting time the last few weeks since the Christmas meeting. Try and have a look. I mean, there's all sorts of things in the sky to look at. Um, 12P is a really interesting comet. Uh, it's going to get brighter over the next uh, few months as it comes towards perihelion. Try and have a look at that. Look at Jupiter whilst, uh, whilst you've got the chance. If you get home tonight, have a look at the moons around Jupiter. Um, generally, lots of things in the sky. Of course, it's, it's, as we go into the spring now, we're, we're moving into the spring constellations. The nights are getting shorter and shorter. And before you know it, we'll be in the summer and uh, there won't be any nights at all.